Okay, on to our next topic, which is optical dispersion. So, obviously, optical loss can cause you to lose your signal over long distances. So if you go try to go too far, eventually you can no longer get good data out the other side. And that would be also referred to as attenuation. Here's your nice little data bit stream of ones and zeros. In this case, it's just ones separated by a distance here. And then by the time you get further out, they've reduced in, uh, in their magnitude. And so at some point, they'll be so weak that you can't detect them anymore. Now, typically we can make the optical loss really low, and we can boost it by amplification. We'll talk more about that later. So the big issue is when you go to really high data rates with the pulses very close to each other, you get a problem due to dispersion where you've got the pulses like this, but then they broaden out and they start to overlap. And so, sure, it's easy to basically have a detector measure a signal like this coming in, right? But if you're going to high data rates, you want to basically increase your frequency by having as many ones and zeros within the shortest period of time, right? And so if this is my, my uh, duration of the signal, how many bits can I cram into that period of that transmission, right? Well, the problem is with dispersion is that these will actually broaden out. So if these broaden out, then I would end up with a pulse like this, a pulse like this, a pulse like this, and a pulse like this. So if I get all these pulses to broaden out like this, the net pulse looks like something like this, right, if you combine them all together. And I can see no differentiation between each individual bit. So this is a major issue. And so there's a couple types of uh, dispersion we care about. The first is material dispersion. I'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about waveguide dispersion, nonlinear dispersion, and modal dispersion. Material dispersion is one of the easiest to understand. It's simply that the refractive index changes with wavelength. We've talked about that many times before. And so you can imagine if I'm sending an LED signal where this is power versus wavelength down, a, um, down an optical fiber, then the shorter wavelength portions of the LED spectrum would see a higher refractive index and therefore they would travel more slowly. And so that would be why a nice crisp pulse broadens out over distance because the longer, I mean the shorter wavelength portions of the, of the light are slowed down because they see a higher refractive index. Now you're like, wait a second, in, in high-speed telecom you use lasers. They have a very narrow bandwidth here. It's typically only a few nanometers. But if I'm going over a very long distance and I'm going to really high data rates, this dispersion can still be enough that it becomes an issue at very high transmission rates. And so you have, to be, you have to make sure you design such that this is not a big issue. Let's talk about the next type of dispersion now. So let's look at modal dispersion, and we'll first look at this in terms of the effects of the waveguide itself. And so, basically, modal dispersion, you have a, a pulse come in here, and at, by the time it gets to the end of the optical fiber, the pulse is split into multiple pulses such that your overall signal is broadened out. And so why did you end up with all these different little pulses? Okay? This is different than material dispersion. This is not different wavelengths. This is actually different pathways through the optical fiber. So let's say we, we take a step index multi-mode optical fiber, meaning there's multiple ways to travel. Modes are ways to travel through the fiber. And it's called step index because the refractive index of the cladding to the core is an abrupt step function. Okay? Well, I know if this is wide enough that light could travel straight through, light could travel at this angle, or light could travel at this angle. Which is going to be a faster way to get through the fiber? Straight through or to go this longer path length like this? And so this is exactly why you could have a couple different angles at which light could travel in the fiber, and the pulse over time will then broaden out where these are the ones that basically take the longest angles, and this one here that arrives first is the one that took the straightest path. Okay? You can see the same thing if you have a graded refractive index or GRIN multi-mode fiber. In this case, the refractive index profile gradually increases towards the center of the fiber. And as a result, you see a, gra you don't, you see a gradual bending of the light, but the same thing. You could go straight through, or you could take this longer path, which takes more time. So the fiber, you'd say, well, the fiber I want to use, then, is a single-mode fiber. Make the, the core small enough such that light can only travel straight through. Then the should problem should solve itself. Well, partly. This path length problem will be solved, but not everything will be solved. It's a little bit more complicated, and that takes us to the next slide.
So, when we have only a few modes left, light travels in a fairly straight line, no zigzag. And you're like, wait a second, if it's in a straight line, why do I have more than one mode? Well, what we have to also consider is how much of the evanescent optical field or electric field is in the cladding, okay? Because obviously if I have a photon moving down in here and it has an E field to it, E field, you know, if you looked at, you know, when we do um, E and M fields and you looked at a positive charge, it basically is strongest when you're near the peak E field and it decays with distance. Well, when you're confining this down into a single, what we call a single mode fiber, but it's really, a, there's still a couple modes in there, okay? The E field intensity, which I'm plotting here, or the power, you can measure it either way, isn't all confined within the core. Some of it penetrates into the cat cladding and it falls off at an exponential rate. Okay? So why would this matter? Well, if I looked at a front view of the E field intensity, okay, and this is actually I should mention here, this is showing the wave moving forward, and then you can see the portions of the wave there in the cladding as well. Okay, so that as it as it evanescently decays into the cladding. But let's look at a front view of a case that we would have no dispersion. You basically look at the E field intensity. This is the center of the fiber. Photons are coming right at you. E field's the strongest in the center, and this dark blue means no E field. So if all the photons look like this, they'd all travel at the same speed and the same, line, same direct line. But look at this front view. This is for a fiber where things only travel straight, but you have two different types of E field distributions or modes. Okay? So beyond this, I could have this one, which would be a second, or this one, which would be a third. And what these kind of look like is, remember if you did quantum mechanics, you looked at a quantum well, and there was all these different sort of wave functions you had where in a quantum well, um, even though things were tightly confined, you could have different uh, wave functions. This is the optical equivalent of a quantum well where there are different quantum states of confinement for the photon when you bring it down to a very small confining cavity like this you don't see these things appear until you bring it down into this tight confinement just like a quantum well. If you basically make it too big you lose all your quantum states. And so here's the big deal about this. Look at this distribution here. In this one the E field is even more tightly centered inside the middle of the fiber than this mode. Okay? And then this one it's more towards the outside so there'll be more of it towards the cladding. Well this one would travel more slowly than this one because if it has more E field distribution out in the cladding which has a lower refractive index meaning the photon will travel faster this would arrive first this would arrive later and so you can see how these quantum type modes you have in an optical fiber even if the lights going perfectly straight will start to give you dispersion as well so how many modes do you have for a fiber if, it, if you get it to the point where it's traveling straight down there well, you're going to need to use the mode chart, and those of you that have probably taken our optoelectronics course here have seen this, but maybe you don't understand it. So let's demystify this mode chart, and, I'll, and for those of you who have never seen it, I'll explain it for the first time here, okay? And so the first thing we'll need to do is we'll need to take our wave equation, which we had before for a photon in, in 3D space, where omega, again, was the angular frequency, and that's with respect to time. That gives you the time-varying component and k is your wave number or propagation constant which is your how it changes with respect to distance and instead we're not going to this was solved for free space we're going to solve it for a, a propagation in a cylindrical system like a fiber so if you ask for volunteers don't do it it's pretty tough it can be done but it's difficult and so a cylindrical system here's my axis z radius r and my angle phi in that cylindrical system if you solve it, the wave equation goes from something like that to something like this, where this is a Bessel function. How wonderful is that, right? <laughs> nice and easy. Instead of uh, k, I now have beta, which is like k, but it's basically like how much of my propagation constant is projected onto the z-axis. So this versus this. So it's how much is projected onto the z-axis. Gamma is just a phase constant, and Q is an integer in this equation. So let's, let's go a little bit further and start to understand. We'll use some of these terms on, the next, on this next slide. So let's look at this chart now. This chart is B, which is called the relative modal propagation coefficient, which is calculated as follows. 
and this is v, which is the dimensionless v number, meaning there's no units when you multiply this all out. And then you've got these lines. What are these lines? Well, what these lines mean, that is if I solve for v and for b for an optical fiber, it will put me somewhere on this chart, okay? If I end up here, that means that this optical fiber can support no modes at all, okay? Meaning that it's the core is so small and the wavelength of light so large, etc., that the you can't, it's not enough to confine the light, and if you have no confinement, you don't have an optical fiber. As soon as you go to this side of this first line, this first mode, LP01, is allowed. So you, this would be a true single mode fiber with very low dispersion because this would be the only mode that's allowed. And then if you go to here, all of a sudden the second mode appears. Now you're starting to see dispersion because these are a little different. Then this third mode, you can see that these are quite different in terms of the EPL distributions. And then fourth, etc. If you keep going, if you apply this further, there'd be more and more modes, but we're stopping here at V equals 5. Okay? So, how do we kind of figure this out? Well, let's just do some simple, simple uh, um, variation of, of, of parameters here and see what happens. Let's look at the size of light. So if I increase my wavelength here, if I increase lambda, then V would go down. So increasing wavelength means I go in this direction. Well, look at that. Less modes. That makes sense. If I have a long, bigger size of my wavelength of light, then I should be able to fit less types of modes of light in an optical fiber. If I make my wavelength smaller, this gets smaller, this gets bigger, I can fit in more modes in a, inside, the way, inside the optical fiber. That makes sense, right? Look at confinement. If my refractive index difference goes down, meaning the core and cladding have closer refractive index, this becomes a smaller number, which means B increases. So I'll go in this direction and I get less modes. That makes sense because if you have less refractive index difference between the core and the cladding, you have less strong confinement, so it's harder to confine these other modes. And of course, if refractive index goes up, then B goes down, and then I could get more modes. So if I would see more modes. Last, let's look at core diameter. You could vary some other parameters, but we'll just do one more. Core diameter, meaning the diameter of the core of the fiber. If my core diameter goes up, then V goes up, and I get more modes. Well, that makes sense, too. If I have a bigger core, there should be more ways for the light to propagate down it. And, of course, if, if A goes down, V goes down, and I get less modes. Okay? So, again, remember, less modes is desirable. It means less broadening of our data pulse. Now, if there are lots of modes, you can actually just calculate it numerically, okay? If you have a large V number, okay, you can just calculate it numerically. So you, here's how you calculate V number, 2 pi, core radius, wavelength of light, numerical aperture for the fiber. And then the number of modes is 4 V squared, this V number goes in here, divided by pi squared. And so let's do a sample calculation. Let's assume we have a silica fiber, which is silicon dioxide, Refractive index of the core is 1.52, the cladding is 1.442, so it's a difference of 0.01. 850 nanometer wavelength of light and a core radius of 25 microns. Well, easy to calculate numerical aperture with the refractive indices. I can calculate V quite easily because I've got wavelength of light and core radius, and I get 37.9, and if I put the, that, therefore, into M, I get 585 modes for this fiber. So this is far from a single mode fiber. It would have a lot of dispersion of optical dispersion. If you remove the cladding and it made the cladding air, M jumps to oh, almost 14,000 modes. Why is that? Well, it's because you've increased the numerical aperture, right? You have a much higher index contrast. And that was the same thing we had here. If you had a higher index contrast, you get more modes, and you can see that in this equation. So let's say, okay, I want a true single mode fiber, just the LP01 mode. Well, that means that we have to have a V number of less than 2.405, right? Right around here, 2.405. It has to be less than that. Otherwise, this other mode could show up. So let's assume that that's our constraining um, item. Let's assume a silica fiber of these refractive indices, the same difference, 0.01 between these two. So I know my numerical aperture will be the same as this, even the refractive indices are different. 1.3 micron light, okay? And then I'll calculate the V number to satisfy this. And you'll find that your core radius has to be less than 4.86 micrometers to achieve single mode operation for these refractive indices 
and a wavelength of light of, uh, of 1300 nanometers. If you reduce the refractive index to 0 0.0025 by 4x, then you'll find that your core radius can be larger, actually, to achieve the same thing. So then you would basically achieve single mode with uh, a core radius so long as it's less than about 10 micrometers. And here's some more modes. If you looked at all the modes you could have, there's more than this, but these are the ones you could kind of observe in a fiber. So this is that, there's that L and, L and um, M ind indices for modes. So this is mode index L, mode index P. The L and the M characterize the azimuthal and radial distributions on the, of the E field. I'm not going to go a whole lot into that. This gets you go and take a whole course in physics on this. And this the P stands for polarizations. Basically, you can have two different types of polarizations, which matters if the detector is polarization dependent, which is often the case. Okay? In fact, one way to trick, they make optical fibers that you can put two different polarizations down, or you put it as polarization preserving, such that you could basically get higher data rate by then splitting those polarizations at the other end and getting not one data signal, but two on the same optical fiber. And you can also get superposition of two modes. So when you do this in lab this week, you'll see common, you can generate combinations of various modes and see them superimpose on each other. Now the mode diagrams I want to note are for the E field. So how do you get that into intensity or watts per meter squared? Well, you've seen us do this a lot. Basically, you square the E field. So at the end of the day, if you want to undertake these and get a plot of what the intensity in terms of optical power per unit area is coming down the fiber, you just square the mode E field intensity, and that gives you the intensity in terms of watts per meter squared. So I think this is pretty cool because this week you're going to actually see these modes shined outside the other side of an optical fiber. So tell me, how often do you get to see the Fourier transform? We got to do that last week. And then how often do you get to see the optical qu equivalent of quantum confinement? So you'll never see a quantum well with an electron in there, right? But in this course, you're going to see quantum confinement and what it does to photons. You're actually going to visualize, with your, visualize it with your human eyes. So this is one of the great things about this course I love is that you actually get to see some pretty complicated effects that you can never observe directly with just your, just your senses. But you can in this course. So if you look at state-of-the-art, uh, one thing I want to mention is that that classical dispersion where the refractive index of the core and the cladding caused dispersion, well... One of the reasons why, if you look at, if you get down to these, these few modes or single mode, and you look at your dispersion coefficient, which is how much dispersion you have, there are two types of dispersion that, that come into play, but, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but if you change the wavelength of light, all of a sudden you'll get to the point where they cancel out, and you can get zero dispersion at 1.3 microns. And so in the early days, this was really convenient for early optical fiber communication systems. They'd say, well, let's do 1.3 microns. In fact, Europe pushed this strongly for several years. The U.S., however, pushed 1.5 microns. And that later became more important worldwide because, one, it has the lowest loss that we saw in the previous, previous portions of this lecture. And it matches the wavelengths of the best fiber amplifiers. We'll talk about those in a second, but that's important as well. So, what about this dispersion at 1.5 micron? Well, now they've made dispersion shifted fibers where they're able to shift this out to 1.5 microns and then get a nice zero on the, uh, on the y-axis for dispersion as well. And this is done by modifying the refractive index of the core. Some of these index profiles have triangular, trapezoidal, or a Gaussian shape. So instead of being a nice, a nice step function, they'll do some kind of trapezoidal or other type function and, and to, to basically shift this dispersion out. A little complicated, but just want you to be aware that there are ways to reduce the dispersion even further. So, that was a lot of information. Do some review, take a break, and then we'll finish this thing off.